Good morning, guys. That was pretty good. Well, hey, I'm Ryan. I'm the Discipleship and Connections Pastor here at the Valley. If you are a first-time guest, man, we know it takes a lot of courage to go into a new place, a new space. So we just want to give you a round of applause. Let's give our guests a round of applause. There we go. There we go. Three of you are doing a good job. I'm putting you on the applause team. You're hired. So um, let me tell you about one of the most random and tough places I ever found myself in. So I was getting my master's, and I needed some extra money, and so I became a substitute teacher. Probably wasn't mature enough for it, but hey, you know, they hired me, and it was 80 bucks a day, so that sounded good at the time. And I remember one morning, I get a call, and they call you crazy early. It was like probably 5, 6 a.m., and for a college student, that's really early, in case you didn't know. So I woke up, I answered the, the phone, and they said, hey, would you be willing to come to this elementary school and teach? And I thought, okay, well, I was actually a junior high and a high school guy, but I needed the money, so I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Hung up the phone. I was a little nervous about elementary school, but then I realized that I was amazing at elementary math. Like, five plus five, two times ten. Like, what do you got? You know, two digits, three digits. You know, like, I'm like, okay, I got this. Reading, like, I can read a Dr. Seuss book in easily under an hour, every time. So, like, I'm like, I've got this, no problem. I can handle anything this elementary throws at me. So I go, um, and I go to the school. It's one I'd never been to before. I go down the stairs, go to the office. The secretary looks at me and says, okay, uh, you're going to be substitute teaching for our choir teacher today. She usually gets the piano out of the janitor's closet, rolls it into the gym, and then she just, you know, leads choir, plays piano, and sings. And she probably saw the deer in the headlight look. I don't know if you guys knew this. I don't play piano. I don't sing. If pitch were arrows, I couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Um, And she looks at me and sees my face and goes, do you play and sing piano? And, uh, or sing piano. Do you, see, I'm that bad at it. Um, I'm like, no, I don't do those things in whatever order, you know, I don't do those things. And she looks at me and goes, wow, what are you going to do about that? And I said, well, I guess I'm going to get the piano out of the janitor's closet. I'm going to wheel it to the gym. We're going to have choir today. So I go, I get the piano, and as soon as I open the janitor's closet, I notice that on the top of the piano, there's a CD player and some CDs, like my salvation had arrived. It was wonderful. So I roll them into the gym between CD songs and dodgeballs that were already in the room. You know, we'd play a game of dodgeball, sing a song, dodgeball song, and, um, and the day actually was going really well, all until that one kid in the back of the class showed up, right? If you're a teacher, you know who I'm talking about. I, uh, I, I'm getting the kids to sing or play dodgeball, and every time I try to get the kids to do anything, she looks at me like this and goes, <laughs> just shakes her head no. And you know me, I'm like Connections Pastor. I'm like, come on, guys, let's do motions. You know, we're singing Under the Sea, and I'm like, let's all be a starfish. And she just looks at me. And, you know, I have the kids kind of separate so they can't hear each other sing, so nobody's getting made fun of. You know, I'm controlling the classroom so well. I'm like, come on, sing with us. And she just looks at me shakes her head no, you know, and I'm like, okay, fine. So I'm I'm going through the songs. Next song on the list to play was Amazing Grace. I'm like, okay, this is a public high school, but sure, you know, whatever. It's, I mean, it's it's on the CD. I'm not going to take the CD out. So we start playing Amazing Grace, and that girl looks at me, just like walks away, sits down on the bleachers, and I'm like, okay, now it's on, you know, like walking away from me. Okay, so I walk up to her, you know, I'd kind of been on this girl's case to participate. She wouldn't participate in anything we did. So I start walking, I get closer, and I realize she's crying. And I'm like, I didn't think I was that bad of a teacher, right? Um, So I sit down next to her, um, and I kind of sense that this might actually be a holy moment. This was, for me, was a random place in space, but all of a sudden I felt like, okay, God's trying to slow me down here. So I say, hey, I'm sorry you're crying. What's going on? And she says, we had the funeral for my dad this weekend, and this is the song we sang. And my heart broke. Not only did I feel like a jerk, um, my heart was just broken for that girl, and I I really had no idea what to say, but despite that, I felt like in that room at the moment, I could almost feel the presence of God, not only convicting me for how I had treated her, but helping me to figure out those next step forward in that moment. Well, we're talking about places and spaces, specifically the random places we find ourselves in. And we have them, right? You have all kinds of places and spaces. You have church, you have family, you have work, but you also have things like maybe coffee shops or gyms or libraries, or maybe it's the uh, the hardware store or Home Depot. They're places that you frequent all the time. And sometimes these places can be filled with joy and excitement, but sometimes 
those places and spaces are really painful. Maybe there's trouble at your home. Maybe there's trouble at work. Your life isn't turning out how you wanted it to be. And these places and spaces that were meant to bring joy, they're just places of pain and confusion, and you don't know why God is doing what is going on, right? But the reality is today is I really feel like the random places of our lives, the hard and challenging spaces that we find ourselves in are actually moments for us to encounter the living God. And that's what Jacob found out. Today we're going to look at the story of a guy named Jacob. Now I need to tell you from the beginning, when we talk about Bible characters, you're usually thinking that these are good people, spiritual heroes, right? Noah, Abraham, Isaac, these are guys who follow God, who try to do the right thing. Sure, they sin and they mess up, but that's just once in a while. Jacob is an absolute crook from the day he's born to the point where we find him in this passage. He's not a good guy. There's no indication that he is a follower of God until this moment. And so today we're going to look at Jacob, and what I want you to understand is that no matter who you are, whether you're Christian, not a Christian, first time in church, millionth time, maybe you feel like this is going to be my last time in church, wherever you're at, I want you this morning to encounter God. Not necessarily in the spoken word, although we're going to do that. I'm going to preach a message, but I really hope that you understand, like Jacob, you can experience God in the random and painful places of your life. So let's go to Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. And let me talk to you about what's going on right before this passage. You see, when Jacob was conceived, his mom, Rebecca, had twins. They knew it was in her stomach as she was as, she, as the babies were, were, I don't even know what you say, as, the, as she was pregnant with them, as she was growing babies. I'm not exactly sure how to phrase that. But as the twins were in her womb, she began to feel wrestling and fighting. And God said to her, there are two nations in your womb. Any of you have ever had, you know, two boys, you know they fight, right? These guys are starting in the womb. They come out, and in those days, the firstborn would receive two-thirds of the inheritance. He would be in charge of the other, other siblings. He was the one that was seen as blessed. He was the one who was seen as the kid who would continue on the family line and lead. So Esau is born first. He's red and hairy, and they're trying to tell you that he's like a man's man. He comes out, and they literally name him Esau because that's close to the word for red. But then Jacob comes out, the second born, and literally his hand is grasping his heel. It is almost as if Jacob was fighting to be first. He was fighting for the blessing. He was fighting for his life from the very womb. He's literally trying to crawl over his older brother. And they name him Jacob, which in Hebrew actually means he who grasps the heel. It's another way of saying somebody is a crook, a deceiver, or a charlatan. And Jacob lived up to that. In fact, the passage that we're reading today, Jacob is literally running for his life. And why? He's running for his life because uh, while his brother was out hunting one time and came back famished, Jacob, who was a homebody, who as far as we know until this passage, never left home, Jacob finds a way to steal the birthright or inheritance from Esau. So now Jacob is going to get 100% or three-thirds of the inheritance, and Esau is going to get nothing. But as Isaac's on his deathbed, he says, Esau, I want to bless you. I want to bless you and make you the head of the family. Even though you don't have money, I can still confer a blessing. But then crazy, a crazy story, you can read it on your own, but Jacob literally figures out a way to steal the blessing from Esau. And so after this, Esau is like, that's it, I've had enough. When my father dies, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kill Jacob. Well, Jacob finds out, and he decides to flee from Beersheba Beersheba to Haran. Now, those are very, very far away. Jacob has probably never left home his entire life at this point. It actually makes a point of saying Jacob stayed with the tents when it's talking about him at an early age. He never even ventured away from where their family was camped. That's a five to six hundred mile journey. It is like walking from Troy to Philadelphia. It doesn't say that he took tents with him. He didn't have any possessions because Isaac hadn't died yet. So he literally had nothing. But he sets out alone and afraid and runs all the way to Haran. He's a couple days into his journey. He's tired, he's alone, and he's afraid. 
and that's where we're going to pick up. If anybody had a reason to think God is not with me, God has left me, I can't experience God right here, right now, that would be Jacob. Let's look and see what happened. Chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Now, I would assume that was painful, but let me try it out, okay? Let me see if I can find a rock. Oh, look, there's one right here. Okay, how'd that get there? All right, so I'm going to lay down on this rock just to see how comfortable it is and read the rest of this passage, okay? Hang with me. All right, here we go. Rest of the passage. Let me get my pillow on here. Oh, that's so comfy. Uh, Verse 12. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you your descendants, the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Let me explain what's going on in this passage because it's easy to miss. Jacob has this dream and he sees this, this, depending on your translation, a ladder or a staircase and there's angels ascending and descending on it. What image should we have in our minds? Probably not this. It's a Home Depot ladder, I think. Um, if you want that, you can have it for like one fifty nine ninety nine, I think. But it's not that. We might think it's a staircase. Like if you Google Jacob's ladder or stairway to heaven, if you don't get an old rock song, you'll see this. And that's probably not what the passage is talking about either, although that's, that's, you know, pretty and, and magical. Here's what was in Jacob's mind and in his reader's mind. This right here, this is a picture of a Babylonian ziggurat. Now they used to, that the top is gone, but the top would actually be called the, how, the, the gate of God, or sometimes the gate of heaven. Those stairs that are there, you would actually, the people who were trying to hear a word from God would not actually go up those stairs. You would have priests, important people, and it was their job, just like the angels in this passage, to ascend up to hear from God and then to send back down. You see, in Jacob's day and age, much like ours, they really believed that you had to go to certain places in certain times in order to hear from God. For them, it would be like, oh, you got to go to the church building. You got to hear from a priest. You got to hear from a teacher. God doesn't speak to regular people. He only speaks to maybe kings and princes and important people, and you have to go to these special places. But it's not even the angels that bring the message to God. God directly speaks to Jacob in this vision. God is saying, you don't need to go to a certain space or place. I am here with you right now in this random place. And God promises to bless Jacob. He says, I'm going to give you descendants and land, and I am going to bless you. And so Jacob walks away from this place where he had a dream Is he still going to have to face the consequences of his bad decision? Absolutely. Is he going to go through more times of challenge and pain? If you read the story of Jacob, absolutely. But this man, at the lowest point of his life, walks away from this encounter with God with a promise and a future. No longer does his life have to be dictated by his sins, his past mistakes, or his circumstances. From now on, he is met with God, and God is with him. Jacob still goes through spiritual struggles. You can read it on. He's a very real, lifelike character I think most of us can identify with. But after this encounter with God, he's a changed man. And that's what I want for you today. 
I want us to look at Jacob's dream and I want it to give us a vision for how God might speak to us today and how we might leave from this place realizing God's presence is with us. It's important to understand that God is with us when we are in pain. Just like Jacob, I imagine that Jacob thought that no way is God with me. He was with my father, he was with my grandfather, but he can't be with someone like me because of all the bad things that are happening to me. Every time in my life something bad happens, I am always tempted because of my pain to run away from God, but when I make the decision to run towards God in my pain, I find that not only does God heal me, but he speaks to me through pain. I hate to be honest, I hate that this is true, but the most painful times in my life were also the times when God reshaped me. The hard and difficult times were the times when God brought stuff to the surface in my heart and life that I needed him to take out. C.S. Lewis put it this way, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers us it to us in our pleasure, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. What C.S. Lewis is saying is pain has the ability to slow us down, that God often shouts to us in our pain. Me and Jamie had just gotten married. We were living in an apartment, no kids yet, and um, we're living together our first year as husband and wife. One time the uh, power went out. And so all the residents, we came out of our apartments and we're, we sat down and we're talking. People we didn't know very well, all of a sudden we started to have these great conversations with in this very random place of the stairwell of our apartment. Our neighbor, who we didn't know that well, April, the converse topic of church came up. I'm not even sure how, but I remember her saying, my grandmother was the person um, in my life who was a follower of God. She always impressed me with her faith and I would go to church with her every single Sunday. But when she was older, she passed away. And I was so mad at God and thought, my grandma loved you, she, she cared about you, she tried to follow you. If you allowed her to die, then forget it. I'm not gonna go to church anymore. You see, April experienced pain and she walked away from God. And as I got to know her, man, that good, bad, or indifferent, she wasn't filled with happiness, she wasn't filled with joy. She never, as far as I know, never got over her grandmother's death. I shared with her on that night that, yeah, my father passed away recently too. My dad had passed away about a year before that moment. And I said it was really hard, and I was angry with God. There was a lot of things I didn't understand. And in my pain, I was tempted to run away from God, but I just, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not any different than you. I just made a different decision. I decided to keep following God, and he really is helping me get through this hard time. Let me be clear. God doesn't cause your pain. He just wants to use it. I tend to think when we talk about God not, God not causing your pain, in Jacob's story, his pain, the fact that he was away from his family was all because he had sinned, he had messed up, he had cheated, he had lied. Sometimes you have pain in your life because of your bad decisions. Sometimes you have pain in your life because of other people's bad decisions. Sometimes you have pain in your life because we live in a sinful and broken world and sometimes bad things happen for no good reason at all. But God, like a master chef, opens up the fridge of our lives and sees the bad things, the disordered things, the things that don't belong there. Some things he throws out, some things he brings to the front, some new things he puts in, in there. And before you know it, you have this amazing meal out of a place that was just chaos. That's what God wants to do in our lives, but oftentimes he needs to bring us to a place of brokenness for us to slow down long enough and listen to him. Whatever painful moment you're experiencing right now, I want you to understand that God wants you to be aware of his presence. Is your family ripping apart through death or conflict? God is with you. Is the stress of your job making you freak out? Is it piling up and you don't know how to deal with conflict at work? God is with you. Are you afraid you can't make enough money to survive? God is with you. Are you struggling with mental health and you feel like your life is over? God is with you. Don't give up. He loves you he cares about you. In your darkest days, when you feel like you are sleeping on a rock, know that God is with you and you are not alone. It's important to realize that God is with you when you're not alone. I've wondered over the past week, why did God choose now to speak to Jacob? 
And part of me thinks it, it wasn't that God just started speaking to Jacob now. This was the first time he was alone and could listen. You see, Jacob spent his whole life around other people. He spent his whole life scheming and conniving. I think God had to wait till Jacob was alone and at rest to break through his, his stubborn mind and stubborn heart. You see, I think in our digital world, it is so hard sometimes to hear from God because we have constant entertainment that is streamed to us either cheap or free. You have, you have video games, you have, um, you have Spotify, you have your cell phone, you have your car radio. I mean, Netflix is not going to binge watch itself. There are so many things coming at you. Sometimes I think we bombard ourselves with so many things, not only to numb ourselves to the pain of life, but also... It has the unintended consequences of numbing us from the voice of God. The ancient rabbis used to ask, why did God speak to Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham? Why did God speak to some of the, some of the, the patriarchs that you find in the first chapters of Genesis? And one of the ancient rabbis is said to have responded that God was speaking to everyone. They were just the ones who chose to listen. You see, one of the things, if you want to follow God, that has to take place in your life is you have to spend time alone with him in silence and in reflection. If you don't do that, it is going to be a struggle to hear from God. It is going to be a struggle to follow God. I learned this in my early 20s, or late 20s. I was struggling with depression and anxiety as a pastor. I was going through some hard times, and I've preached a whole sermon on that, on depression. You can go back and look at that. And in that sermon, I talked about the, how God healed me from depression through friends, through a counselor, sometimes even through medication. But one of the things I did not share in that message was that one of the places where I experienced healing from God was every week I started to go get alone. I went to a coffee shop, and I literally just drank coffee, sat in silence, read my Bible, and read other books about Jesus. This place was so important to me, I, I literally like would take pictures of my cups of coffee and Bible. We had got one on the screen. That's what it looked like. It was a good cup of coffee. It had that fancy spoon. I never figured out what it was for, but I liked it, right? And this is where my love for coffee really, really grew, but at the end of the day, it wasn't the coffee that made a difference. I was able to get away from the pressures of work, I was able to get away from the pressures of family, and I love my family, but at that time, man, I felt like I was just never good enough. Not their problem, my problem. But it was in that coffee shop that God began to heal my heart because the first time in my life I was seeking alone time with him on a regular basis. One of my challenges you, for you today is to take 15 to 30 minutes to practice the spiritual discipline, to practice, to work with your head, your heart, and your mind, to just go into a room, go somewhere, go on a walk, and literally just spend 15 or 30 minutes silent before God. It's okay to pray. It's okay to read scripture. Those are great spiritual disciplines, but try starting with silence where you are just able to hear the voice of God. Now, When you get silent, if you're used to media on all the time, if you're used to the constant go, go, go of life, one of the things that's going to happen is your insecurities, your fears, your doubts, your anxieties, they're all going to come to the service and you're going to think it's not working. But nothing could be further from the truth. If you get alone and your first thing is fear, doubts, it's because God is allowing those to come to the surface so he can literally scrape them off of your soul. When you get alone with God, it might start with feelings of fear or pain, but my hope is the longer you sit in silence, God won't come to you and condemn you. He didn't come. If anybody needed to be condemned, it was Jacob, but he came and promised to be with Jacob. When you're alone with God, I hope you feel his love. I hope you feel his presence, and I hope you understand that God wants to bless you. God is with you and wants to bless you. God comes to Jacob and says that he's going to bless him. Now, a good question to ask is, is those blessings that he gives Jacob, whenever we use that word in the church, sometimes people talk about material blessings or spiritual blessings. And I think we make a mistake when we say it's one or the other. We could go over here to what is often called the prosperity gospel and say, well, if you just give, you know, 10% or more to the church, then by next year, God is going to give you that brand new car, right? If you give, you know, uh, $10,000 to this televangelist so that he can buy a private plane so he doesn't have to share the gospel and coach, then next year you'll have that half a million dollar home, right? That would be 
That would be wrong. But the reverse is also true. If we say the blessings of God are only spiritual and we say that, well, God won't really do anything in your life. He won't give you your daily bread. He won't take care of you necessarily. But if you just follow him, then someday you might have an awful life. But when you die, you have the hope of heaven. Neither of those messages are completely true. You see, when God comes to Jacob, he says that I will take care of you materially. He says, this land that you're laying on, I'm gonna give it all to you. I'm gonna give you children. I'm gonna bring you back to the land that I promised to give you and your family. But he also promises spiritual blessings to Jacob. He says that I will be with you, that I'm going to bless you and your children, and my blessing is gonna flow from you to the rest of the nations. The reality is that God wants to bless you both materially and spiritually. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread because he really does want to take care of you. It doesn't mean you'll always have the American dream, which I don't know what it is. It seems to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but maybe it's a three-car garage now, half a million dollar home, white picket fence with a security system. I don't know. But whatever it is, God wants to bless us materially, but we have to understand what that actually looks like. When I first moved here to the valley, I felt like God was very, it was very clear to me that God was calling me to come here. And the first apartment we lived when me and Jamie were here, now we're in a house, but we lived in an apartment that was smaller than anything we had lived in, especially with kids, than ever before. Our kitchen was small enough that you could get from one end to the other by doing this, okay? It was, it was a one-butt kitchen. And I remember at times I was struggling with it. And then I remember I was in this moment of, you know, I, we're watching a movie with the kids before we go to bed. We have this wonderful time in devotions. We tuck them into bed, and it's just wonderful and beautiful. If you're a parent, you know what those days are like. You have three of them a year. Um, and, and at the end of it, I remember just sitting on the couch and just saying, God, thank you so much for being good to me. And I felt like God spoke to me very clearly. Isn't this enough? And I realized that in that apartment, man, I had food, I had shelter, I had a family that I loved. Um, I had painful moments, but I also had really, really good ones in that home. And I think what we need to understand is God wants to take care of us materially, but that doesn't mean we need to have everything that our culture says we have to have for success, for identity. We don't need all that. But God also wants us to bless us spiritually. And I, man, here's just a few of the spiritual blessing that God wants to give you if you say yes to him. God promises that we can overcome any difficulty. John 16, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says to his disciples, man, this life will sometimes be hard, but because of me, you can overcome any difficulty. 1 John 1, 9 talks about the fact that all of us can have our sins forgiven, whether it's the first time or the millionth time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. No matter how many mistakes you've made, God can forgive you if you simply confess your sins. God promises that we have hope even after death. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Man, we know if you are a follower of God and you die, you are with Jesus immediately. But then when Jesus returns, the dead, arise, uh, the dead rise from the dead and Jesus gives those who follow him a new body and we live in a renewed heavens and earth with God for all eternity where there's no more pain, no more suffering. My family this year has had a lot of funerals and I've got one more to go to and I'll be honest with you, it is incredibly hard as I get older to continue to grieve for the loss of loved ones. But I've never had to do it without hope. You see, grief and pain and all that stuff is hard and yet Jesus, because of his death and resurrection, we know that it is not the end. God also promises to mature us. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think for a minute, if this described your character, if this was what was written on your tombstone, regardless of what you have, regardless of anything else that, ha that happened, wouldn't you consider that a life well lived? 
And God promises that if you follow me, if you put your trust in me, if you ask me to forgive your sins, my Holy Spirit will come into you and you will begin to become these things. I was getting coffee this week and I asked somebody, I saw somebody I knew and I said, how are you doing? And she said, I'm doing fine, I'm doing good. And I said, well, how's your husband doing? And she said, oh, he's always good. And I was like, what? What do you mean? And she's like, oh, he's always happy. He's always joyful. It seems like nothing can ever get him down. And then somebody next to her was like, yeah, I'm sure it's not all the time. And she was like, no, no, it pretty much is all the time. And I walked away, and at first I thought, well, lucky for him, he has that personality. And then this passage of scripture came to mind. You see, I know that man, and I know his love for the Lord. I know that he has spent years following God. And I know that his character has been shaped by God so that when life gets hard, and he's experienced some very, very hard things, he still has joy, he still has patience, he still has self-control. I want you to understand that God wants to bless you, but he wants to bless you so that you can bless others. God is with us so that we can bless others. You see, God never blesses us so that we hold on to it and keep it for ourselves. In this passage, God says, Jacob, I am going to bless you and so that you and your family can bless the entire earth. You see, God wants to work in us, but anytime God works in us, it is always so he can work through us. Jacob sets up a rock in that passage and pours oil on it. Now, I found myself asking this week, like, why did he pour oil on it? That seems like a weird reaction to, like, a a rock, right? Let's pour some oil on that, right? Like, it didn't make sense. I looked it up in my commentaries, and it said it's because the oil would actually stain the rock, and so that any time Jacob was looking for that rock, he would be able to find it. But not only would he be able to find it, his children and his grandchildren would all hear the story of how God spoke to him. When God works in your life, it is so that you can turn around and bless others. So there I was in that elementary gym. Amazing Grace is playing in the background, and I'm sitting on a bench with a girl crying who just lost her father. What I didn't tell her, because I didn't know if it was appropriate, and it seemed like a trivial matter because she was so young, but my dad was in the hospital, and he would literally die two months later. And at that time, I knew that I, at that time, I even knew that unless God performed a miracle, my dad would pass away. And with my own pain and her pain, um, I didn't know that I'd have the right words to say, but I just simply said to her something pretty simple. I felt like it's what God wanted me to say is, well, just so you know, people sing this song, here are the words, that for those who love Jesus, we have hope even after death. And I know I don't know you. I'm no, I'm just a substitute teacher who was like yelling at you five minutes ago. I'm really sorry about that. But I, I do want you to know that, that God loves you and he loved your dad more than you can ever imagine. And I, I can't honestly remember the girl's name. I don't think I ever subbed for her school again. Um, I don't think I ever saw her again. And I don't, I don't know what happened, but I do know that God was with her wherever she's at. And whatever you're going through, I know that God is with you too. But you, he wants you to encounter him in these random places so that you can not only participate in his kingdom, but be a part of it as well. How is God calling you to be a part of his kingdom? Man, here at the Valley, we have so many ways for you to, like, tell your friends about Jesus, right? I mean, if there's anything we do well, it's giving you tools to talk to other people about Jesus. You have a little Easter card that you can hand to somebody as an invite. You have a little card like this that you can pray and invite people. We have a yard sign that you can stick in your lawn, or if you want to be even more forward about it, put it in your neighbor's yard, right? Get the hint, buddy. Come to church, right? There are so many ways for you to participate in God's kingdom. The question is, are you actually going to step forward and do it? But here's what I want you to do. I want you to share about Jesus. I want you to talk about him. I want you to invite people to church, not just because we gave you some good tools, not just because you want to make Pastor Andy or me happy. I want you to have an encounter with Jesus that is so powerful, so real, that you can't shut up about him. As you guys know, if you've met me for five minutes, you know that I love coffee. 
Some of you have been in conversation with me. I've mentioned coffee to you. Do you like coffee? You say, no, I don't. I see on your face that it's time to change the subject, so I talk about coffee for at least five more minutes, right? And you think he doesn't understand. No, I do know that you don't want to have this conversation. We're having it anyway, right? And it's not, it's not because I'm a rude jerk. It's not because I don't like, uh, I don't value you. I should learn to stop talking about coffee, but the reality is I just get so excited about it that it takes a little while to shut up. And that's what I want for you and me when it comes to Jesus. I want us to experience him so powerfully in the hard moments of our lives, in the good moments of our lives, that we just simply can't shut up. The question I want to ask you today is God is with you, but have you decided to trust and obey him? God is with you, but how will you respond? You know, Jacob here makes a decision. He says, God, if you'll, if you'll keep these promises, if you'll be with me and provide for me, then you will be my God. I will tell others about you. I will follow you. I will obey you. And at the end, I will, I will, give, you, I will give you a tenth of everything. He makes these commitments to God. But I think Jacob misses just one thing, and I think the text wants us to know that. He takes that rock and he says, I'm going to call this place Bethel because God is in this place. This rock is going to show us that God is at Bethel, which means house of God. But go back and read the dream. The point of God's message to Jacob was not, hey, Jacob, I'm in this random place. I'm in this space. His message to Jacob was, Jacob, I am with you. Man, when you come to church here, I hope you feel the presence of God. When you listen to worship music, I hope you feel the presence of God. When you read the Bible, I hope you listen to, I hope you feel the presence of God. But I have to be honest with you, right? God is not just in this place. He's not just in your Bible. He's not just in your worship music. God is with you. And so wherever you go, it should, you should be a mobile hotspot for the presence of God. You should feel his presence and share his goodness and love with others. Whatever that looks like, man. You go, you buy some coffee because you're addicted like me, and you can tell by the pins that the barista doesn't agree with something you believe. But instead of withholding tip, you're like, you know what? I don't care if you, if you think the same thing as me. I'm going to bless you. Here's a big tip, right? Like, you have the opportunity to spread the kingdom of God by just simply encountering God and allowing his blessing to flow through you. He really can do that in your life. Now, it'd be easy for any of us to say, well, Ryan, God was with Jacob, but he's not with me. I mean, there are characters in the Bible that God is obviously with, but that's not me. I'm not Jacob. God isn't with me. And if we just had the Old Testament, maybe I'd have to agree. Yeah, he's with Israel. He's with a couple chosen people, but everybody else is on the outside looking in. But there's a pretty cool story in the New Testament that tells us that we're wrong. Fast forward to the, in the Bible to a descendant of Jacob. His great-great-great-great-great-grandson is a man named Joseph. His fiance gets pregnant, but she swears that she didn't have sex with another man, she says this child is from the Holy Spirit. And of course, Joseph at first doesn't believe her, and he's trying to figure out how to kind of break the engagement quietly. But then, just like for Jacob, a dream comes, and an angel speaks to Joseph, and here's what it says in Matthew chapter 1. But after he had considered this, meaning Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to, make, to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, and everybody say it with me, God with us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is with us. You see, Jesus is fully human and fully God, but he is also a, a message to you and me today and to all of humanity that God is with us. We simply just have to look around and make the decision to trust him and to follow him. So I want to invite all of us for the first time or the millionth time to say yes to Jesus today. If you're online and you're watching and you're not a follower of Christ, or if you're in this room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, here's 
the first step you need to take. Just simply say these words with me. Jesus, forgive my sins. I believe that you lived, died, and rose from the dead. And Jesus, I want to follow you as my king. If you're watching online, just bow your head and say those words. And if you do, you have taken that first step towards following Jesus. The scripture we just read says that he forgives your sins, he makes you new, and you can trust that God is with you. For all of us here today who have said yes to Jesus, I have one thing left for us to do today. On the tables around here, there's two there, there's some in the back. We have these little rocks all around. And I want you to go up today and grab a rock as this band plays, and I want to give you permission to grab a rock and write, God is with me. And then I want you to take this rock and I want you to put it in your pocket. And I want you to carry it for a week. It's going to be annoying. It's going to be dumb. You're going to be like, why am I doing this? And then all of a sudden, God's going to use it to speak to you. Put it with your keys, your wallet, and carry it around with you all week long. And when you're having that hard conversation at work where you don't know what to do or what to say or how to deal with that conflict, I want you to reach in your pocket and realize God is with you. When you and your spouse are fighting and maybe one or both of you have have called it quits, I want you to reach in your pocket, understand that God is with you, and maybe you're going to feel led to say, you know what, if you want to give it one more chance, I will too. Let's go to counseling. And regardless of whether or not your spouse says yes, whether or not they're willing to give it a second chance, you'll know that God is with you. Whatever hard situation you are in this week, I want you to reach into your pocket and realize God is with me. When you look at your bank account and the numbers don't look great, I want you to realize that you don't need to trust numbers on a website to tell you your identity, your worth, or your future. I want you to reach into your pocket and realize that God is with you. And so this week, carry this rock in your pocket. Spend 15 to 30 minutes and just sit with God and listen to him. May you feel his love and experience his power in your life because he is with you and you can trust and obey him. As they sing this song, grab a rock, write God is with me and carry it with you this week. goodness of God. 
can hold your rock in your hand as we pray. Father God, help us not to forget that you are with us. Father God, that we can make a decision to trust and obey you and experience the good things that you have for us, Lord. Sometimes that's a material blessing, sometimes that is a spiritual, but Lord, ultimately we know it's both. And so, Father God, for my friends this week, Lord, when they're in those tough, painful, random places they never expected to be in, Lord, Help them to remember that you're with them. God, speak clearly to us about who you are calling us to share your love and your kingdom with, Lord, whether through a yard sign, a card, or just saying, hey, this is what Jesus has done in my life. Father God, you are amazing and great and awesome. Help us this week to realize that your presence is with us, that we don't have to be afraid, that we don't have to be lonely that we can make a decision to trust in you. I don't know what the road ahead looks like for my friends, but I know that you're going to go with us. And so God, help us to see you, help us to say yes to you, and help us to follow you this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.